I don't know about you, but it kind of feels like monitors haven't really improved much over the last, like, 10 years? At least when looking at the same panel type, like this is an ASUS PG279Q. It was released in 2015, over 8 years ago now, and yet it's a 165Hz, 1440p IPS gaming monitor. You know, the sort of specs we would look for today. It peaks at 350 nits, which isn't amazing, but isn't exactly awful either has the usual 1000 to 1 contrast ratio, and claims a 4 millisecond response time average. Considering most modern displays are outright lying about having 1 millisecond response times anyway, surely there isn't actually much of a difference here. Well, let's put that hypothesis to the test. I should mention that our modern representative here is a Gigabyte M32Q. This isn't a perfect match, you know, 27 inches versus 32 inches and all, but they are both IPS panels, with the M32Q being from 2021. It's also what I have available, so that's what we're going to go with. So what is the difference, you know, what's different about that M32Q? Well, it uses a super speed IPS panel, but otherwise it's pretty similar spec-wise. It lists 350 nits of peak brightness, a 170 hertz refresh rate, and a 1000 to 1 contrast ratio. So nothing has changed then? Well, I think the devil's in the details. One of the biggest changes has been to do with how the panels produce the wonderful variety of colors they do, specifically their color gamut coverage and their color accuracy. Color gamut coverage is basically a test to see how much of any given spectrum the display can produce. In this case, our old PG279Q can do well over 100% of the sRGB spectrum, and 77% of Adobe RGB, and 81% of the DCI-P3 spectrum. Now, that's actually pretty good. It isn't absolutely amazing, but I would call it good enough for sure. The much newer M32Q doesn't do all that much better, with only like 83% Adobe RGB and 88% DCI-P3, but I should mention that there are a myriad of other 1440p displays, many I've tested myself, that can either do more like 100% of either Adobe RGB or DCI-P3, or just outright or considerably uh, wider color gamut than the M32Q. I think the M27Q actually springs to mind there as a great example of that. Color accuracy, on the other hand, is the big one here. Using the Spider X's largest test pack, with 48 different colors tested, the PG279Q is literally off the charts for inaccuracies. A delta E of under 2 is what you're looking for to be considered accurate, but some of these results are over 5, 7, or even over 10. While you do get a final average of 2.61, which isn't all that bad, that's purely because the grayscale colors are reasonably good, but anything with actual color to it is way off. Contrast that with the M32Q's results and just wow. A delta E of 0.96, with the worst results only being 1.94. This is what you want to see. This isn't even a calibrated profile, this is just raw from factory accuracy. Of course, one of the major changes is to do with my favorite niche topic, response times. That's basically how quickly the pixels can change color. The faster that is, the smoother and more crisp motion looks, and the better a playing experience you get. The times they quote have always been complete BS. The PG279Q is meant to have a 4 millisecond average, and the M32Q is meant to be a 1 millisecond gray to gray monitor. Yeah, and uh, the sky is green and pigs can fly. Let me crack out my uh, trusty open source response time tool, which I sell over at OSRTT.com if you want to test your own stuff, and see just how BS those figures really are. On the maximum, most ridiculous, most pointless, worthless overdrive mode, extreme, the PG279Q averages 
7.74 milliseconds, and that's only if you ignore the absolutely horrendous overshoot time. If you include the overshoot time, that average literally doubles to 14.79 milliseconds. I mean, one of those errors is 74 RGB values too high. It's meant to be this mid-grey, but it ends up basically full white. You can't just ignore that. Only 6.67% of the transitions fall within the refresh rate window. That's bad. Now, to be fair to the PG279Q, Gigabyte's one millisecond greater grey claim is equally BS. On their maximum, utterly pointless overdrive mode, speed, the M32Q averaged 3.81 milliseconds if you ignore the significantly worse overshoot. If you include that time, it's more like 9 milliseconds, and one of those results is 111 RGB values too low. In graph form, that looks like this. It's meant to hit that same mid-grey, but ends up being practically full black. That is, frankly, amazingly bad. Now, the ridiculous overshoot-ridden overdrive modes are interesting, but I want to see what the raw panels can do with no overdrive. The PG279Q averages out to 18.5 milliseconds, or over three frames to actually change color at 165 hertz. That means that you will never get anything close to a crisp gaming experience on this. It can't even get close to finishing drawing the new frame before the new one starts getting rendered. You can think of this as a 54 hertz native panel. That's what the response time says it can run at without ghosting. Now looking at the M32Q with no overdrive, that averages out to 7.77 milliseconds. That would be 129 hertz, which is actually pretty close to the 170 hertz refresh rate the monitor is actually running at. That's not bad, and means that you're going to have under one frame of ghosting on average. That's pretty decent, although it definitely could be better, we could have no ghosting at all. But of course, that is what overdrive is for. The interesting thing to me is that in eight years, we've gone from a top-of-the-line high-end gaming monitor using what you might call a 54Hz panel to a mid-range model now running a 129Hz panel. That is a sizable improvement. Of course, once you introduce overdrive, the game changes again. The PG279Q doesn't improve all that much on the medium normal overdrive setting, only going from 18.5 milliseconds down to 13 milliseconds. That's still only 77 hertz equivalent. There is no overshoot here at all, and it's important to note that a tiny bit of overshoot is fine, good even. It's almost impossible to notice five RGB values too low or high, and it's still perfectly fine to have up to 10 RGB values uh, you know, off as well. ASUS didn't find that sweet spot here. Gigabyte, on the other hand, has. The M32Q's balance overdrive mode drops the average to 5.47 milliseconds, which is 183 hertz equivalent, or 13 hertz higher than the monitor's maximum refresh rate. That's fantastic, and while there is a touch of overshoot in the middle transitions, it's pretty reasonable and not something you would notice in games. This, I think, shows not only how the panels have improved, but the overdrive tuning has too. Something else that's incredibly important for gaming is latency. Specifically, the on-display latency. That's how long it takes for a new frame to leave your graphics card and be dis or start to be displayed on the monitor. The lower that is, the better of a gaming experience you have, the, the faster you can react to enemies or hit racing lights. Now, this PG279Q is a G-Sync display, as in the monitor scaler is actually made by NVIDIA and means that the latency here is really pretty good. My OSRTC Pro unit recorded a 3.3 millisecond average which is spot on, under one frame, which is always what I want to see. 
The M32Q wasn't that much faster at 2.75 milliseconds on average, although some of that is due to the slightly faster refresh rate on the M32Q. If we were looking at a non-G-Sync display from 2015, I think we'd see a much more considerable difference. Most monitors that I've tested in the last three or so years have all been very good on latency. Even the more budget options have been great, whereas almost 10 years ago, not so much. The other big changes have all been in the features. G-Sync is a great one to start with, as eight years ago, G-Sync monitors were very much the peak performance. FreeSync was launched in 2015 too, although that was just the VESA Adaptive Sync standard with some added branding, so wasn't nearly as polished or high performance. Nowadays though, it's really quite rare to see a G-Sync display, or specifically a G-Sync Ultimate display. That's the same sort of NVIDIA hardware in the monitor, rather than G-Sync compatible displays, which are just FreeSync displays that have been validated by NVIDIA and are using the manufacturer's choice of hardware that just happens to support Adaptive Sync and do it pretty well. Adaptive Sync has improved too, both in supporting new things like HDR and improving things like latency. The only thing that hasn't improved with Adaptive Sync is the Adaptive Sync range, as in how low the monitor will let your frame rate drop before it takes over and just starts repeating frames. That's almost always at 48 or 44 hertz these days. So if you get, say, 47 FPS, your monitor will repeat a frame before then re-engaging with Adaptive Sync. Now, seeing as I mentioned HDR, that's worth mentioning too. There are a number of still IPS displays that can output upwards of a thousand nits of peak brightness, allowing for a pretty decent high dynamic range experience. Now, I'm still not a big fan of that unless it's an OLED, but the option is there. Something else that can help with that is having a mini LED backlight. That's where instead of a small number of LEDs behind the panel that create that backlight, you have hundreds or thousands of often individually controlled LEDs that allow for a good full array uh, local dimming experience, creating effectively an, intra an infinite contrast ratio because you can turn off the lights in certain parts of the display to get f functionally infinite blacks while still having hundreds or thousands of nits in the brighter areas. There's also Quantum Dot, which helps improve the color accuracy and gamut coverage of newer displays too. And lastly, I thought I'd mention that the build quality, especially of the panels themselves, have improved as a general rule too. IPS panels often suffer from an imperfect seal around the edges of the panel, allowing for light to bleed through and create lighter areas. Generally speaking, I've seen that issue a lot less on modern displays, and outright backlight bleed has generally been improved as well. So it turns out that monitors, especially or at least specifically IPS monitors here, have actually improved over the last 10 or so years. Add to the fact that the PG279Q was an $800 monitor MSRP, while the M32Q is a $500 monitor, and that's not even the best value around. The M27Q is probably even better, or an even better example at, I think, $330 MSRP. So you get a significantly better monitor for less than half the price. That's progress. Of course, those are my thoughts and some test results, but I would love to hear yours in the comments down below. Do you think that monitors have improved enough that it's actually worth upgrading? Or are you gonna hold out on whatever you have until you can swap to a different panel technology like OLED, for example? Let me know in the comments down below. I'll leave a link to the M32Q and hopefully the M27Q if I can find that available in the description if you're interested. Of course, if you want to see more videos like this one, more monitor reviews, in fact, I should have quite a few of those coming up soon, do hit the subscribe button and turn on the bell notification icon. If you want to pick up your own open source response time or latency testing tools, head to osrtt.com, that's linked in the description as well. And otherwise, that's kind of it. I have plenty of other videos on the end cards you can check out. And uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching. We'll see you on the next one.